Thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. We were somewhere around Barstow, on the edge of the desert, when the drugs began to take hold. Like many great films, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas wasn't exactly appreciated or understood in its time. It was a critical and commercial failure upon release, with many calling it pointless, repetitive, and in the words of one critic, one long offensive treatise on just how vile two human beings can be. What's strange to me is that Hunter S. Thompson's original novel received widespread acclaim. Many writers and journalists consider it to be a seminal piece of American literature, with Cormac McCarthy calling it a classic of our time. So was something just lost in translation? By all accounts, it's largely a faithful adaptation, with many of the scenes lifted directly from the novel as well as other works by Hunter S. Thompson, and with some of its most iconic passages being used almost verbatim in the film. It seems odd that what people people seemed to love so much about the original work was exactly what people seemed to deride in the film. And maybe it's because novels are inherently infused with our own imagination, something that a film can't accomplish in the same way. Or maybe it's just a story that works better as text. The film, to me, is a masterpiece that has a visual bravura that few films can match, with some of the greatest character performances from two actors at the top of their game. It's often hilarious and at times incredibly uncomfortable, and always unlike any other film that I've ever seen. It's a ride that offers an unflinching portrait of psychedelic drug use and the death of the American dream. It's not always meant to just be fun and games. As Terry Gilliam states, We start out at full speed and it's... The drugs kick in and you're on speed. Whoa, you get the buzz. It's crazy. It's outrageous. The carpet's moving and everybody's laughing and having a great time. But then, ever so slowly, the walls start closing in and it's like you're never going to get out of this fucking place. It's an ugly nightmare and there's no escape. The film makes use of many different techniques to simulate the disorienting experience of the different drugs used in the film. Whether that's the almost ever-present Dutch angle, the shifting lighting that doesn't exactly make practical sense, or manipulating the sound to create unease. For instance, as Duke and Gonzo load up on ether, listen to the constant shifting pitch of the background music. Blurred vision, no balance, numb tongue. The mind recoils in horror, unable to communicate with the spinal column. Which is interesting because you can actually watch yourself behaving in this terrible way, but you can't control it. Each drug had its own accompanying cinematic language to convey its effects. As highlighted in the American cinematographer, they are as follows. Ether, loose depth of field, everything becomes non-defined. Adrenochrome, everything gets narrow and claustrophobic, move closer with lens. Mescaline, colors melt into each other. Flares with no sources, play with color temperatures. Amyl nitrate, perception of light gets very uneven. Light levels increase and decrease during the shots. And LSD, expanded consciousness, everything extremely wide hallucinations via morphs, shapes, colors, and sound. One of the benefits of the film's style was being able to get away with some less than ideal techniques to accomplish certain tasks, like the outdated rear projection technique used to simulate driving through Las Vegas, or the frequent use of ADR, which stands for Automated Dialogue Replacement. It's what filmmakers resort to when they weren't quite happy with the audio of a given take and have the actors re-record their lines in a sound booth. But there are many times where the audio in Fear and Loathing doesn't quite match up with the way the characters' mouths are moving, which normally would be a problem, but it just adds to the feeling of disorientation of the film. Though the visual quality was actually one of the few things that most critics at the time praised. The point of contention for most seemed to be that the visuals weren't in service of anything valuable just to act as a depiction of two men twisted on drugs, but for those who can look past all of the hedonistic indulgence, you can see that there's a lot more going on underneath the surface. I would compare it a lot to Martin Scorsese's The Wolf of Wall Street. Interestingly enough, Scorsese actually tried to get his own adaptation of Thompson's novel off the ground with Jack Nicholson and Marlon Brando to play the leads before abandoning the project, but both deal with excess in all of its forms, to serve as a commentary on the perversion of the American 
Silent Dream. The subtitle of Thompson's original novel claims as much with the phrase, A Savage Journey to the Heart of the American Dream. Duke and Gonzo dive headlong into the frenzied world of Las Vegas, confronted with the harsh reality that the love generation with all of its speed and momentum was coming to an abrupt stop. We were riding the crest of a high and beautiful wave. So now, less than five years later, you can go up on a steep hill in Las Vegas and look west, and with the right kind of eyes, you can almost see the high water mark. That place where the wave finally broke and rolled back. There was a social revolution happening in the 1960s. The hippie counterculture was gaining momentum, with its focus aimed at civil rights and anti-war protests, sexual liberation, and exploring altered states of consciousness. And for all intents and purposes, they were winning. But it didn't last. Growing contempt for the hippie community from nearly every group of society, the ever-expanding war on drugs, and acts of violence within the community like that of the Altamont Free Concert or the Manson family murders began the downfall of the movement, the wave that finally broke and rolled back. And soon, the promises of the movement lay neglected and unfulfilled, with consumerism and excess becoming the nation's new standard. And nowhere was that more evident than in Las Vegas. Who are these people? These faces? Where do they come from? They look like caricatures of used car dealers from Dallas. And sweet Jesus, there are a hell of a lot of them at 4.30 on a Sunday morning. Still humping the American dream. That vision of the big winner somehow emerging from the last minute pre-dawn chaos of a stale Vegas casino. The American dream is the ethos of the United States, the ideals and values of a nation that claims that anyone should have the opportunity to create a better life for themselves, for their children, regardless of sex or race or class or religion. Outlined in the Declaration of Independence with the proclamation that all men are created equal, given inalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But it had become clear to many that these rights didn't seem to apply to the black community, or the gay and transgender communities, or just about anyone else who wasn't white or Christian or male. Not to mention the class systems that were becoming increasingly divided and increasingly harder to rise above. Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist Chris Hedges wrote in his book, Days of Destruction, Days of Revolt, the vaunted American dream, the idea that life will get better, that progress is inevitable if we obey the rules and work hard, that material prosperity is assured, has been replaced by a hard and bitter truth. The American dream we now know is a lie. We will all be sacrificed. The virus of corporate abuse, the perverted belief that only corporate profit matters, has spread to outsource our jobs, cut the budgets, of our schools, close our libraries, and plague our communities with foreclosures and unemployment. But there's a reason, there's a reason, because the owners of this country don't want that. Forget the politicians. The politicians are put there to give you the idea that you have freedom of choice. You don't. You have no choice. You have owners. They own you. They own everything. They got you by the balls. They, they spend billions of dollars every year lobbying, lobbying to get what they want. Well, we know what they want. They want more for themselves and less for everybody else. Because the owners of this country know the truth. It's called the American dream, because you have to be asleep to believe it. This is the hard and bitter truth explored in both the novel and the film. The tired faces, fat and drunk, throwing their money into a rigged game that can only crown a winner when everyone else loses. A place where abhorrent behavior is tolerated as long as you cut them a deal. A culture of hypocrisy that says these vices are okay, but these will land you in prison. Las Vegas is the perfect amalgamation of the real face of American values, a place that thrives on chaos and greed, that promises all of the comfort and luxury you could imagine, provided you can afford the price of admission. Where had we gone wrong as a nation? 
Where war was once something to be avoided, now it was a tool for political influence. Nixon lied to the American people, claiming to want to bring an end to the war only to sabotage peace efforts so when elected he could be the one written in the history books. And instead of pulling out of Vietnam, we invaded Laos and Cambodia, bringing more death and destruction in a war that no one wanted to begin with. Richard Nixon represents the dark side of the American dream. He's done through everything that I uh, not only have contempt for, but dislike and think should be stomped out. Greed, treachery, stupidity, cupidity, positive power of lying, total contempt for uh, any sort of human, constructive, political instinct. Everything that's wrong with America, everything that's been, everything that, that, that this country has demonstrated as a uh, as a national trait, that the role it defines repugnant, the bully, the bully instinct, the, you know, the power grab, the, uh, the dumbness, the insensitivity. Nixon represents everything that's wrong with this country. As to the question of where things went wrong, it's hard to say exactly. Political bias, ignorance on behalf of the American people, blind trust in the democratic system that failed us. But that blame did not solely rest on the conservative and right-leaning members of society, as evident in Raoul Duke's final speech in the film. All those pathetically eager acid freaks who thought they could buy peace and understanding for three bucks a hit. But their loss and failure is ours too. What Leary took down with him was the central illusion of a whole lifestyle that he helped create. A generation of permanent cripples, veiled seekers, who never understood the essential old mystic fallacy of the acid culture. The desperate assumption that somebody, or at least some force, is tending the light at the end of the tunnel. What I think contributes to Fear and Loathing's longevity is its ability to confront these heavy subjects, but to find the humor within, and to do so in a way that's critical of both sides. There's something endlessly satisfying about watching two guys twisted out of their minds trying to navigate this strange landscape, confused and terrified at every turn. Because whether your drug of choice is LSD or alcohol or sugar, aren't we all just wandering aimlessly with no clue what the hell is going on? Just trying to find some peace of mind or some sort of escape from the terrible circus that surrounds us. There's only one road back to LA, US Interstate 15. Just a flat out high speed burn through Baker and Barstow and Purdue. Then onto the Hollywood freeway straight into frantic oblivion. Safety, obscurity, just another freak. And the freak. Without Squarespace's support, these last few videos simply would not have been possible. Working with them was a no-brainer for me as I signed up to make my own website with Squarespace almost a year before having any contact with them. It's quick and easy to set up, even for people like me who know nothing about web design, and it's even easier to keep updated because Squarespace takes care of all of that for you. You never have to download any patches or upgrades, it's an all-in-one platform that frankly is even easier to set up than a YouTube channel. Squarespace are offering my viewers a special discount, starting with a free trial, and if you decide you like what you see, you'll get 10% off of your first purchase. All you have to do is go to squarespace.com filmradar or click the link in the description. Whether you're looking for a place to advertise your business, to create a digital storefront, or like me, want a place to showcase your artistic portfolio, Squarespace has a wide variety of starting templates and many further customizable options to create your own unique site that fits your needs. Again, the link is www.squarespace.com slash filmradar. The link will be in the description and you'll get a free trial as well as 10% off of your first purchase. Thank you for watching. Last episode, I mentioned that Fear and Loathing was my favorite comedy, and I was mentioning that I was considering making a video on it, but I didn't know if there was going to be enough interest, uh, but you guys totally uh, proved me wrong. Uh, there was a lot of interest, probably at least like 50 comments came pouring in asking for a Fear and Loathing video, so I hope you guys enjoyed it. I know I didn't really focus on the comedic aspects of the film as much as, you know, the American dream and some of the themes that the film explores, but hopefully you guys enjoyed it nevertheless. You could definitely argue 
argue that I'm reading a little bit too much into it, and maybe I am, but that's part of the fun of making these videos, is just getting to dive deep into your own personal interpretation, whether or not it's what the author intended, I don't think it matters. But either way, I would love to know your thoughts on the film in the comments. Uh, even though it has come a long way since its release, I still think that it deserves more praise than it tends to get. Thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring this video, and thank you to my patrons for supporting me month after month. You guys are absolutely amazing, and I really appreciate your support. As always, thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.